welcome to powerful conversations hosted by the copilers foundation our topic today is preparing for anticipated social issues in post pandemic era i'd like to welcome our guest ips mr alok singh police commissioner noida and retired major general neeraj bali sena medal indian army i'd like to request the audience to please type out their questions in the chat box we will try to take them up at the end of the seminar if not we reachable through our email address that is info@copilersfoundation.org i'd like to now request major general bali sir to please take forward the conversation thank you thank you megna and uh, well let me begin by saying that alok and i have shared a little bit of conversation just before this and uh, the way we are going to go about it is that i will bring out issues that are on my mind one at a time and then of course alok will bring out his perspective which is going to be a more i would say more relevant perspective because he's the man on the ground uh, with the experience so we will go back and forth and uh, hear what our views are now <clears throat> we all know that right now we are at a stage where we are struggling between uh, struggling in balancing between life and living or preservation of life and making a living i think we are at a precarious stage we are at a stage where if we don't get it right we can it can lead to the collapse of some portions of our the way of life and if we get it right then of course we'll be able to surmount the challenge my hope is that it is the latter but the question of our times is how are we going to enforce discipline to make sure that people do what they are required to do uh, we as a society do what is required to be done and i think one of the things we need to do is to build a consensus to start a narrative where everyone agrees what is the right thing to do uh, i was watching a news clip today about brazil and that's exactly like our country in many parts where people are questioning the lockdown and, and just simply coming out so we obviously can't have that situation we also have a situation where there is some potential of friction within the society uh, even within communities because of all the economic hardship that we have to face so uh, i hope that foundations like core pillars may be doing a great job by starting a narrative by kindling interest in building a consensus which might take us forward so <clears throat> i'm going to come up with my first issue later but i will first turn it back to alok to tell us what is on his mind what is occupying uppermost on his uh, thought process good morning uh, general uh, as you very rightly pointed out about the about the various uh, forces which are trying to pull to the society in different directions under this pandemic it's um, really a big challenge to build up a consensus but uh, going by the demography and our, our uh, various economic strata's it's it's very difficult to come by and uh, the first uh, great choice which uh, and the challenge which comes is in, in the face of the health sector uh, when the numbers rising uh, uh, as uh, we move to unlock unlock down uh, the, the 56 days in the push the day for the petition uh, we have an as our uh, health infrastructure but The, the scenario which is now not flowing, uh, the structure is under great strain, and now um, it's for the health authorities to pick and choose uh, depending upon the symptoms or how symptomatic is symptomatic, or whom to hospitalize and whom to treat at home. So that is the first uh, major point of uh, and a uh, uh, decision which is coming up, and uh, there are uh, bound to be different views, and it might lead to. Uh, major law and order issues from the administrative perspective. Uh, we are geared for it. Uh, there have been uh, instances where uh, the hospitals have uh, chosen uh, X over Y, depending upon the medical condition. But uh, as a as a fundamental right, everybody wants to be treated. Everybody wants to be, be tested and treated. Uh, which out of the present circumstances are the best of the things? Uh, going by the medical guidelines and what we have shown, as we as we move towards uh, building up a herd immunity, uh, we have to select about who to be uh, medically 
hospitalized and home to keep out. Now, this has uh, uh, this has been causing uh, some friction in the society, and uh, that is where the administration has to step in. Uh, and uh, although the police forces were never trained for uh, medical rights, but now yes, they have uh, learned the capacity, the, the intervention techniques. And they are preparing themselves to help uh, sort out of this situation. And uh, this is the time when all frontline COVID warriors have to be kept safe, uh, and so that a sense of order um, prevails and the whole system can deliver optimally. Uh, what do you have to say, um, General Bali? Uh, it's a it's a very perceptive point. It's an excellent point, and I think very rightly it should have been the first point of discussion. I am not going to build further on the uh, what you've stated because you really give a very comprehensive. Uh, viewpoint but there is something in your conversation that i want to pick on you mentioned about the fact that not everybody gets the same treatment and people want the people want to be tested but there are different status of our society who are being treated differently now i have a view uh, it may be a lonely view but it may be a view which might resonate with everybody else now if we were to slice the demographic of our country i would say there are three broad categories the affluent the middle class and the poor now, all of us have been affected. The affluent have been affected essentially because the businesses have taken a hit. The productions have stopped. The production is not likely to commence at, at full steam. The workers have gone home. They are having to fire workers. The supply chains are broken. The cash has dried up and so on and so forth. So there is one part. But if you look closely, the personal life of the affluent has largely remained untouched. Uh, people say that money can't buy love. But I think money is a great companion to have when you are uh, under disruption and no further cash is coming in. So, to some extent, the poor, the, the rich are a little insulated from the effects of what we have gone out. Let's take the other end of the spectrum. The most horrendous effect has been on the poor. The daily wager, the migrant worker. The other day, a local was driving the, the, the fate of uh, migrant workers to me and we walked in it. Now, as horrible as it has been, and I don't want to play down the horridness of what has gone on with the poor, but I want to make one more point, that the poor are perhaps not such strangers to privation, hunger, uh, unrequited uh, wants, and so on and so forth. I want to clarify, I'm not playing down the situation. I'm merely saying that there is a degree of resilience among the poor, which might make them a shade better to be able to be with what is befallen them. It is the middle class, the urban guys like us, who are possibly heading for a psychosocial trauma. And these are the guys that the police commissioner and everybody else will probably be dealing with increasingly. Because we have left poverty decades behind us. We have not known hunger for decades now. And suddenly, we've, we, we the entitled people feel, why is it happening to me? What is it? How is it that I'm losing a job? How is it that I'm going to take a pay cut? What about the education of my children? You look at that and you look at the return of the migrant worker and the poor into our cities. There is, the migrant worker is neither an employee nor an employer of the middle class and vice versa. There is really no connect there. And therefore, I think we have a little bit of a combustible mix. I think as, as status of societies go, we've got to take greater care of poor, far greater care of poor, but we also have to worry about how the cycle social thinking of the middle class will happen. Uh, yeah, hello, you uh, General, uh, when I spoke about uh, the health system, I was not talking about the economic segments. I was talking about the medical segments, about how symptomatic a person is, how, how immediately or, or on an emergent basis they need a medical intervention. But as you very rightly pointed out about uh, the migrants and the and the, the kind of uh, distress they had to undergo. Uh, we have uh, seen the two waves of migration, first beginning around the 28th of March and the second one, which very recently abated. Uh, uh, there was a huge food crisis. There was a huge food crisis for them. They were completely let off uh, by their employers, uh, by the, the businesses they were working, and also the middle class, also the middle class. There were, there were uh, household helps, there were the people who would do ironing on your shirts, or people who are doing working for your uh, daily errands, 
Yes, not all. There were um, good citizens, the uh, angels uh, on the job of different uh, citizens uh, association. But uh, as, a, as a society, when we look at it, we completely uh, left them and uh, left them to go, go back home. And now when we need them again, we are trying to persuade them. Uh, I have been getting the representations from various uh, industries to please bring back my labor, which which is not that easy. It is not easy when we Hello? And now when we need him, we will get back. Hello. Can you can you hear me, General? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Uh, can you hear me, General? Yes, yes. Okay. So so uh, now when we need him back, he will choose his, his time and place to come back. And this is not going to be easy. Uh, the, and in case uh, we have to go for uh, another wave of lockdown, even a limited wave of uh, lockdown, there, would be, uh, there could be a food crisis. And uh, as we have seen in the first uh, wave of migration, uh, the police and the administration, uh, along with the uh, many houses, NGOs who are doing charity, uh, we could um, distribute food and ration to them, uh, but that is uh, not a permanent solution. So this uh, this is another situation which could come up in the times in case we go for a, another phase of lockdown. That uh, there could be a huge numbers who would be uh, who would need some kind of uh, state support to, for their uh, daily livelihood and their daily food. Absolutely, I uh, absolutely agree with every word that you said. I uh, I wanted to add something to it, which I a couple of days ago I was reading this uh, fabulous online journal called The Morning Context, and The Morning Context uh, sent out a survey to several hundreds of employees of various companies and said, "Have you heard from your employers, and what are they telling you during this crisis?" So they said. People said the usual thing, uh, employers are talking about the cost, they're talking about jobs being cut, they're talking about bonuses, they're talking about future prospects, and they're talking about taking care of your own health, etc., etc. There is not one employer who's written about the greatest tragedy that has befallen us, the migrant immigration or the migrant return since our independence. It is symptomatic of the kind of people we are. We are focused on ourselves. And the migrant labor excites our attention only when we see it in a TV grab and so on and so forth. Let me contrast you this with what is happening elsewhere. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has written an email to all his employees and spoken strongly about the racial issues that are happening in America. And he's saying, this is the time to wake up. This is the time to remove this racism from amongst us. And he's doing it at a time when some of the Apple stores have been ransacked by the same writers. All right. So the point I'm making is this, that while there are some honorable exceptions within us, the Gurudwaras, some of the other religious places, some kitchens, some ordinary citizens delivering food, and I find a dare at foundations like old pillars, who are trying to do something rather than only sitting back and commentating on it. But most of us, but this is drop in the ocean, and most of us as a society are largely indifferent. I'm going to add one more point to this because it's, it is again connected with something which Alok told me a little before, a time before, uh, and then I will turn it back to him. It is an unrelated subject. Many paradigms have shifted. Education, work from home, lots of stuff has happened. I want to, I want to talk about a different perspective about work from home. What's happened today is that while many of us have found this new uh, approach quite nice, you don't have to waste time on the traffic, the pollution is less, you can sit in the comfort of your own clothes, and you can even look at your own home, the morale is up and you can work. But you know, this is casting a very different kind of burden on the women folk. Women who are working from home and working for home are now occupied round the clock. I have some wonderful friends, well-placed friends, and I talked to them and one of them said, you know, I've been, I've been turned into Gangubai. Now, on a serious note, 
unless we move, unless men folk move towards a more egalitarian approach to this, I think this business of everybody being at home and women taking inordinate loads may break them physically as well as as well as mentally. I think this is an issue that we should address. And uh, so, but there is a more serious uh, aspect of it which Talok will probably tell you. Yeah. <clears throat> I completely agree with you, General, on this uh, about the strained uh, relationships. Not only the relationships at home, but many other relationships have come under strain. Uh, you very rightly mentioned about uh, what's happening within the four walls, within the confines of uh, of a home. We have seen a uh, um, increase in this uh, in the domestic violence and the and the crime against women happening within the four boundaries. Uh, there, there are uh, increased suicidal tendencies. It's not only because of uh, work from home, but also coupled with the, the economic uncertainty, then this, the uncertainty of the disease itself, how long will it continue and when can it affect. Um, there, there are uh, uh, increased number of cases which have been reported about uh, this uh, conflict at home. And uh, administratively, we have uh, devised a mechanism where uh, People should not think that uh, the police is uh, also maintaining a social distance or they are just busy, busy with the containment of the areas. Uh, we have a um, uh, device in online system where a person can call our um, uh, emergency dispatch number, which is 112, and uh, followed by an intervention by the police. Uh, once the issue is settled, there is a follow up two days after the incident where uh, a lady constable or a lady sub inspector would call, call up the uh, house and find out if everything is okay. And then again, after a week, this exercise is repeated with that particular house. If things don't settle by then, then definitely we proceed criminally against them. But that is only one aspect of this trade relationship. I, there are many others which I would like to bring forth, uh, like the employer employee relationship, which you very well mentioned that uh, nobody has heard. And the landlord tenant relationships. This is completely come under strain. Uh, these are such relationships uh, which were taken to be of very civic nature, but because of the pandemic, they have become under great strain and um, they're seeking police intervention, which is, is leading to uh, a lot of litigation. This otherwise would have been peacefully settled in a, in a, in a civic dispute forum. So all these relationships are coming to the strain and uh, we will see a very, very different um, uh, social composition uh, once there is a complete unlockdown. It's just really very heartening to hear that uh, there is such a great focus on domestic violence, which has been a subject of our, I think, for ages in our lives. But you, like uh, you very rightly said, uh, these things have become exasperated because of the situation. I want to talk about uh, another aspect of our social, even economic divide, and that's in the area of education. Now, we are hearing endlessly that the education going forward is going to be a hybrid model. The brick and mortar schools and colleges won't disappear. But obviously, because of social distancing, the threat of another pandemic breaking out, we are going to have a mix of online uh, digital, digital education as well as the uh, offline on ground education. Now we've got to spare a thought right now at the digital divide and what it might do to the poor. Because it is all very well uh, for us sitting in the cities. And even in cities, let me tell you, many teachers are struggling with technology, with bandwidth, with uh, infrastructure to, to run these classes. But I'm just thinking, how is it going to play out in the rural areas? Are we going to tell the people in the rural areas who we glibly call Bharat, or the real India to carry on their old ways of sitting under a tree and maintain no social distancing and learning? Or are we going to then show up, uh, are we going to start a conversation that we must quickly build that infrastructure, change mindsets, and give training to the teachers to be able to run education? Because there is a fear that because of the dilution of engagement that might happen when you are studying online or when you are teaching online, the entire value of the education might begin to come down unless we take actions in that regard. And my the focus of what I just said was, of course, uh, very much on the rural end of the business. I think somehow in cities we take care of each other. So that was one point I wanted to make. Yeah. 
colloquium. Yeah, you very rightly mentioned about the rural sector, and uh, I would like to highlight here uh, with, the, with the migration happening, uh, there's a lot of lot of stress and strain on the on limited rural assets that a family had. Uh, can you hear me, General Bali? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's there's a lot of lot of strain on the those very limited assets uh, people in rural areas had. The families had migrated. Uh, the land was uh, being used by a brother or two who left the home. Now there's a lot of lot of pressure on it, and this is further leading to you know, social problems within the families in the rural areas. They, the the migrants who have moved from the cities, they are no more welcome. The the, the emotional appeal. I'm, I'm sad to say has died down, and the uh, dispute over, over, the, over the land and possessions that has started coming up. And, uh, they are like they say, nadharka nadharka. They, they are neither welcome there after the initial 14 days of quarantine. So um, uh, this has also given rise to um, something uh, which was an online fraud, which was uh, uh, otherwise um, thought to be. Reserve of uh, only the urban areas, but now the, the latest film shows uh, that there, there are gangs uh, which are uh, in cyber fraud and online frauds. They are coming from official towns. Uh, there are certain areas of uh, Jharkhand, I am to mention, and uh, there are all those smaller places which otherwise were unheard of. Now people don't have uh, any any other means to earn their livelihood, and this new space. Uh, the cyberspace, they are uh, exploring it, and um, uh, those frauds are happening uh, almost every day. So, uh, also, as a word of caution to all our viewers here, that one has to be uh, very careful uh, in their online dealings. All right, so that's, a, that's definitely a new perspective. Um, uh, this whole, because the fact is that we live in an aspirational country. We have already stoked people's ambitions, stoked people's aspirations, and now suddenly to bring everybody several notches back and expecting that things people will remain, will accept the status quo, may not happen. So you're very right that today it is cybercrime. Tomorrow this may spread to, uh, I hope not, other areas. Just as we are witnessing in the US, the large scale writing that has taken place is uh, is not uh, has got deep seated reasons. It's got reasons of deprivation for ages, of not really wanting what they have, and the rest of the society not caring for the African American. So it comes out in strange ways. And like Alok said, uh, it's uh, very much on the card that it might happen on the cyberspace as well. Uh, having said that, I think if we start looking towards solutions to this problem. Quite clearly, there is no silver bullet solution. And quite clearly, nobody can even give a very specific framework on how should we tackle all the issues. But if I was to speak in a very macro sense and to provide a framework, I would say that this is a great time for the government civil society to uh, to develop a partnership, how that is going to happen, we can talk about, and even intra civil society to, to have a partnership. Because unless we now start caring for each other, unless there is at least a dialogue of that nature, unless there is, uh, uh, you know, some empathy for the other side, I think we will be sitting on a tinder box, which will also result in law and order situations like Alok very rightly brought out. So therefore, I think whether you are a, you, you obviously the government can't take care of everything. Uh, the government may be the engine, but then there are the NGOs, there are the community groups which are already in action. The companies could be asked to largely divert their CSR on COVID-related uh, social issues or economic issues of the poor or the dispossessed, and, uh, and 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 people like and societies and foundations like Core Peers. I'm just taking Core Peers as an example. Must start getting a seat on the table where people come together and take it as a corporate effort. Is it an easy thing to do? Of course not. It's not utopian. But the fact of the matter is that unless we all come together at this point of time, this may not work out. Uh, and I think to that degree, the kind of conversation we are having might might make some difference, might make a little difference, but might make a difference. So that is what I have to say. 
General, uh, I would like to further uh, implore on what you were saying uh, about uh, cooperation between the citizens and uh, uh, not only being dependent only on the government, but uh, let me tell you uh, in uh, the state where uh, I come from and where I'm currently working, the government has taken a, a very extensive exercise on the skill mapping of the almost uh, 37 lakh people who have come back to, to the state. Their skills are being mapped and then as per the requirement, they, they are being shifted. They are being provided with, a, with, a, with an option of shifting to those industries which require those skills. Not only that, a very easy process of um, giving them giving them soft loans for um, having their own startups, very own rural startups that all has been initiated at the government level. But as you very rightly pointed out, that a lot of that of a lot of hand holding has to be done at the at the citizen level. Uh, it's uh, not only health, only in the physical health point of view, but I would say that uh, this is a situation when everybody's health is in the hands of somebody else. If if you are wearing a mask and I am not wearing a mask, then I am compromising your situation also. So this is a situation where not only the physical health, but the wider health of the nation is in the hands of each other. I, I so completely agree. And uh, you know, often people clearly say we are we are all in it together. And uh, sometimes our actions don't really reflect that. But uh, I think the spirit of what you said is that since all of us depend even for our mortality on each other it's a great time for people to come together and to realize that you can't do it alone uh, if you in fact isolate yourself and think that you can do it alone or you really don't care what happens outside your room or your house because you're on a lockdown then you may be sitting on a tender box and uh, that may not be a great situation uh, very laudable to hear what the what the government of UP is doing about skill mapping and so on it's a wonderful initiative one has heard about it and I must tell you that even foundations such as Four Pillars with, with which I have the honor of being associated is also taking steps in the direction of uh, imparting skill training, even uh, guiding women especially on how to pick up skills which can make them into some sort of minor entrepreneurs on their own or even to get employed in areas where they could have thought of earlier. So I think as a society we need to look at all of this. Uh, I really don't have much more to say except one. I'm not much of a slogan man, having left all the slogans in the army. But if I was to coin a slogan for myself today or the coin a slogan for um, anyone else who cares to take it, it would be this. What can I do? I think that might be the motto we, some of us may like to adopt. What can I do? Rather than just thinking that uh, Somehow the help is going to come from somewhere else and there will be a policy announcement and something will come out of the television. So that may not happen. So what can I do is something I think we can adopt. Oh, very rightly put, uh, General. And uh, like a like, uh, 24 hour round the clock police person, uh, I would like to just add one more sentence to it. With the social distancing and the masks, it should not become another helmet that when you see a law enforcement agency inside you put it on and then take it off i have i've been seeing it in the in the public spaces the the masks are hanging down the chain and the moment they spot a heli around the around the corner it comes up this is the time we really put on the masks that's what i would like to appeal to my viewers thank you Thank you so I much, sir, for such an insightful session. Yes, please go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just wanted to say that there's a question for Mr. Alok that I can read yes. on the screen. Yes. Ratna, has, Ratna Sharma has asked, how is police planning to manage the anticipated social unrest arising out of stress and anxiety in the post-lockdown era? So I, I'm sorry I took the job of the anchor for a moment, but Alok, you can answer this and then we can wind it up. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Rachna, I wish I could have uh, a very uh, clear template written in front of me to read out for you that uh, 
how will the police do, do it? it it's uh, going to be an extremely uh, complex job there there are uh, various reasons for the social unrest uh, we are tackling it uh, differently at different levels in the in the rural areas as i mentioned uh, there's a lot of stress because of uh, the pressure on the limited assets so the skill mapping is being done and the and the and the activities uh, and the capacities of the people are to be used to the fullest and uh, coming out in the in the urban scenario where i mentioned about uh, the stress in the domestic areas we already have a um, plan in place which is already functional this is headed by a dcp level officer a, a women officer who is handling this the, the stress and the anxiety which is building up in the homes and for the cyber issues which i mentioned again we have put in a team in place which is both creating an awareness and also uh, tracking down the offenders uh, i hope uh, i had a much broader template to read out to you but as of now this is what we are doing but constantly we are learning and improvising the sense Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for such an insightful session. It was an honor to have you both on board. Please keep an eye on our Facebook page for our next session, which will be on the same time, same place, same day next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor.